everyone, I'm Molly Lindquist, part of the Manta Cares team, and I want to welcome you to our Patient from Hell podcast club. The purpose of the Patient from Hell PCORI episodes, funded by the Patient Centered Outcomes Research Institute, is to bring PCORI funded researchers onto the podcast to share about their research so more of us can learn about it and how to use that research to help us in our own lives as patients and care partners. And the podcast club gives us the opportunity to chat with members of our community to get their thoughts on each episode. So today I'm super excited to chat with two amazing guests. We have with us Erica, the Director of Cancer Information and Education at our nonprofit partner, Bay Area Cancer Connections, and Janet, who is an ovarian cancer patient. And so we're gonna to speak to Janet about her personal experience with cancer, as well as hear more about the great work of BACC from Erica. And then I'm gonna get their thoughts on episode 41 of the Patient from Hell podcast, Enhancing Patient-Provider Collaboration for Better Health Outcomes with Dr. Sapuka and Simmons of the Massachusetts General Hospital Health Decisions Science Center, which is a mouthful. <laughs> so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Erica to tell us a little bit more about Bay Area Cancer Connections. Thank you so much, Molly. And it's a pleasure being here with you this morning and with Janet. Um, I work for an amazing nonprofit, Bay Area Cancer Connections. I've been with the organization for 14 years now, but the organization was created 30 years ago um, by an amazing woman named Jill Friedenrich and her doctor, a Stanford surgeon, Ellen Mahoney. And it was created because there was a huge need for cancer support. 30 years ago, people didn't talk about their cancer diagnosis, let alone um, get support during the process or have help finding and understanding information, et cetera. So it began as a small little endeavor um, in Ellen's office, and then it's grown and blossomed into the wonderful place that it is today. Um, we, we support anyone touched by breast or ovarian cancer with services that aim to inform and empower and one of the really unique things about our organization is that what we do is personalized. So it's not as if you call us and we just give you um, the same spiel as we give the next person. We really stop to listen, learn about the individual and their situation and help them in whatever way that we can. So we have a wide variety of different programs that we offer, ranging from support groups to counseling to fitness and wellness classes, financial support. And then the part that I uh, direct is the personalized cancer information and education, where I can meet with people one-on-one -on -one or with their support system to help them understand their diagnosis better and their different treatment options um, to educate them about cancer in general and their specific diagnosis, and then perhaps most importantly, to help them make informed decisions. That's wonderful. And Janet, are you uh, willing to share a little bit about your story today with cancer? Well, first of all, I want to say thank you to the both of you for having me here today to be able to share a little bit about my personal journey and in particular with my new family at the BACC organization, it really has been a lifeline through it all from start to, well, we haven't finished yet. So I was diagnosed in 2020 with stage four ovarian cancer. It had metastasized into my lungs and a little bit into my stomach. Um, I think at that verge, we were just at the very beginning of the COVID, um, you know, shelter in place life. I really, I think I was shock and prior to the diagnosis i had been uh i had suffered like three major losses in a five-year window so my mother passed away in 2015 my life partner passed away in 2018 and then my last family member passed away like right before i got diagnosed and so i was struggling through working with that emotionally um and physically, because it was debilitating. I was very depressed and anxious, but I was still maintaining a part-time job with the county. I'm from San Francisco. Um, so fast forward to the diagnosis piece. I really believe in my heart that I am blessed that I've been given a chance to live through something. Um, and I was very lost, truthfully. And I would say in terms of tailoring what happened with 
my journey when I knew I was going to conclude and I'm very grateful for my physicians at Kaiser here in the Bay area. Um, I did the normal, um, I guess, schedule. I had chemo and it was kind of a waiting game to see if I would respond or if it wasn't going to be to my benefit. Luckily I did respond very well. Surgery was put in and then we did that. I got a one month holiday and then resumed another round. And then around March of 2021, um, I knew I was going to have my final infusion on the 13th. And I thought, okay, let me start looking for support. I had a tremendous amount of support from people I grew up with. Um, so I was, I was very fortunate because I was living alone by myself. And again, it was shelter in this place, the height of COVID. So my best friend I grew up with, don't take me wrong because I'm Filipino, but she's a white girl. <laughs> We're like totally opposite. She's very, <laughs> very earthy. And I'm just kind of like urban thing. And, you know, Barbara Tyree, Banish, she married a nice Filipino guy. And, and he, I asked her, I said, is it okay? Because she literally was staying here Thursday, Friday, Saturday. She'd feed me. We'd have breakfast. She'd tidy up for me. And then she'd go and then come back. That was that was the weekly uh, schedule because I had to have the blood draw on a Wednesday and then it was on the chemo. So that journey came and went and I had, I was grateful. I had buckled on to two outfits here in the city for support, made some new friends. But again, again, this is just my personal uh, encounter with, with me as a Janet with cancer. I had really had a difficult time finding other women that I could relate to in, in large group settings and finding like the right amount of support because I'm pretty physically healthy and I like to do things. And, and most women were that I did connect to passed on within a short frame of, of time of meeting them in the groups. Um, so what happened was I really made it a, a really, really, I think great breakthrough working with the early diagnosed new treatment group on Saturday that meets at three o'clock with BACC and eventually I had to graduate. So one of the therapists had suggested and invited me to come to the metastatic group and I was all freaked out. Truthfully, I was very freaked out because to me, honestly, I'll just tell you, I was so afraid to die. So I didn't know which way the fight was going to go for me. Um, and I don't think I was isolating myself from cancer because it's, it's, for me personally, what helped me a lot was prayer. Um, I have a strong sense of community here in San Francisco from the women I went to school with at a small school here, St. Paul's High School. Everybody was flanking me, and that's something that's I don't really talk about openly, but I did all I was never ashamed of it that I, I am prayerful. And that's one of the things that was key, I think, for helping me not like lose sight of what and where to go and how to ask for help. In particular, what Eric mentioned, there were individuals at the BACC that were like lifeline angels. I'd call and I was confused and they'd go, okay, one moment, we're gonna connect you with Erica. Um, the questions to ask were always baffling to me about treatment, about what to do next. And when I got the reincurrence in particular, I was, I didn't, I just didn't know what to do with that, quite honestly. Um, so I'm going to take a breath now and just say that I've made some friends in the metastatic group. Um, I want to do different things. And I've, I feel like in all honesty that I'd like to give back. So I've, I've been a little more active and engaged um, with other women survivors. And most of the friends I have known in my journey as an adult also are survivors. So I think What's key for me is to hear things that are miraculous. Um, and I think that's what's keeping me like focused. Otherwise, I think I would just be spun out on the, the statistic of what my diagnosis is. And we know what that is, stage four metastatic ovarian. Wow. Janet, thank you so much for sharing your story. I think there were so many things in there that you know, resonated with me, I know will resonate with people that are listening. And I think tie into kind of what the podcast 
today that we're talking about, just about shared decision makings and how do you have, how do you know the questions to ask your doctor? I mean, you were mentioning, and that's something I experienced as well with my breast cancer is you're kind of dropped into cancer land and how do you know, you know, what question, you, you don't know what you don't know, you know? And so um, I'm just curious if you felt like you found a doctor, Janet, who kind of integrated your goals and, you know, listened to your questions and, and kind of gave you that sense of shared decision-making as you were going through. I'm smiling from ear to ear because the deal was, because I didn't love my doctor, but she was just very like, well, I think, you know, we've encountered this. She, she wasn't necessarily warm and fuzzy, mm -hmm. but she's a brilliant doctor. So she doesn't want to hear about my pros and all of that. She just wants to, what do you feel? Where does it hurt? When did it happen? How frequent? She And she wasn't having any of it. So I was kind of like, okay, so I really, it was such a blessing, you know, just to, and now I'm relaxed. So I spat that part about how the cancer came along into my being. Um, her nurse practitioner, Michaela Rodriguez, a Filipina, and I didn't know anybody. The first infusion I had, the very, very first one, it was violet. And I ended up with a UTI. But my point is, I didn't, you know, again, we weren't always running to the to the facility. You talk to these people over the phone or you have a phone meeting and or a video meeting. And she kind of talked with me. She goes, okay, you need to go over here, go to the emergency room, X, Y, Z, Y, Z. So the deal was I was only going to talk to Michaela Rodriguez. And only, if, this is when we parted company in March, and only if I were to have a need to talk to her, meaning a cancer concern, would I talk to Dr. Shaw. <laughs> so now Dr. And Shaw are best. We're besties now. So I've learned her style. Nice. No, she told me, go, Janet, Janet, you know, she would, she literally... And I, you know, when I would ask her things, here's an incident. So my numbers held steady at three to four. So the, the marker tumor for good range is 0 to 35. But honestly, for ovarian people, my Achilles was my stomach. It was just not right. <laughs> Even though I was in the range for over two and a half years, which they thought and said was no evidence of disease. But I kept having challenges with my stomach. So again, I have a brilliant team. I can't say enough about my Kaiser providers either. I have a dietitian and, and I, I to them, are, are, I'm their poster child because I'm so compliant. And Michaela said, she goes, you know, some people just run off and they wonder why they get sick again. But I do listen to my doctors. And so again, like you were saying at that verge, I really didn't know what to ask because I thought literally when they said, you can go now, you're no evidence of disease. I thought it could just bounce back to Janet pre-cancer. And I started doing kind of foolish things like, okay, I'm going to go work out. I was going, oh my God. I gave myself a lot of setbacks thinking I could just go from where I left off pre-cancer. So the Dr. Shaw, oncologist doctor, she wasn't even upset. I She had said one thing to me and I got a I really, I got, a, I got, a, I got irritated. She was like, well, use your common sense or something like that. <laughs> no, I, so again, I think it wasn't her being necessarily mean or um, aloof or cold, or I was just another patient. I don't believe that about her because when it's time and when I had issues like neuropathy early, she would like be on top of it, like right on top of me. So her job, I believe, she does it f for me, not because I'm special, but again, she's a good doctor. So a good doctor doesn't have to be your best friend, but I'm glad we're communicating now. So it's not hard for the two of us because she is taking great care of me. Um, and uh, yeah, she doesn't like 5 million things. She wants to, like I just said, A, B, C, D, and that's it. And that's good because it helps me and trains me to communicate more effectively so that they can help me and provide me everything I need every step of the way she has not missed a beat i you know and i love it when they say oh you should go and transfer to the creme de la creme there's a, a celebrated ovarian doctor they recruited dr michael bookman and i did meet with him um and it was interesting because they are different personalities i we got along swimmingly at this <clears throat> second opinion meeting so she is doing everything to my benefit, it's not because she's lazy. That's her style. I have one too. It's not everybody's flavor, but I'm glad that we get along. And we we both are. And, and you know what? I feel like I feel like she's like she's she's just on top of it. She's not. I don't know. It's just. 
kind of strange how I feel towards her now because I wouldn't talk to her. I never talked to her. And now we are just like, it, it's no going around her through the back end, through the nurse navigator, through Michaela Rodriguez. And I, you know, I think, like you said, um, I'm sort of maturing into this journey, literally, because I mean, when 2024 rolled around, I could either take all of that baggage and all of that stuff from what did occur into now. And now I just want to, honest, I'll just say it. I just want to live well. Um, mm -hmm. I have enough. And again, I wake up every day and it's not because somebody drilled into me the words, oh, gratitude. Because, you know, we all go to these groups and people don't on board right away. But for me, I just think I'm just so willing, you know, to go and do whatever it takes to, to be on the team with them, to help myself find my way around, as Auntie Dolly put it, get bonus points. And I do believe in miracles. I really do. I met like three women and I'll stop there. And I think that's the piece where I don't want to bring that into, you know, a conversation that might not be everybody's you know, viewpoint. But again, I think, I don't know what you want to call it, faith, higher power, universe. Um, and I and I kind of will say this in a lay person's way. It's like, well, I could stay here in the dark or I could go that way and keep mm -hmm. following that star. Um, mm -hmm. And that's kind of part of my practice too. Because I don't, I, I didn't return back to work. I was out for a while. They held my job. And to be honest, I know everybody is different in this journey. And I've said it ahead that, yes, I was orphaned and widowed all at once in the last seven years, but I've learned how to cope with those uh, with new skills also from trying different things. Like instead of eating like an antidepressant pill, which I don't do, I'm pretty healthy. I'll say that up front. Um, and in an urban way, I'm pretty natural, whatever that means. Um, so I try to live well and clean. And I have. I'm also, I've been sober for 32 years wow so you know and again i just i think the pathway that bacc has given me has been a lifeline to, to where i'm at now because they have let me express things not just feelings but but ideas um connect with other people randomly and we see each other socially um it's just a it's just an extraordinary um, organization. I can't say enough about what I've um, been able to learn in terms of skills, life, cancer. Um, and I am very grateful. I, I really have said this to before. I, I really owe my life to BACC. Yeah, that's wonderful. Well, Erica, that's a pretty, <laughs> pretty wonderful segue. Wow. Into <laughs> yeah. Um, clearly the work you're doing, doing is very impactful. And, you know, I'm curious from, you know, that idea of shared decision making with which I know you have a lot of experience in, you know, kind of how you when you interact with, you know, clients like Janet or other people going through cancer, how that idea of shared decision making and aligning kind of personal goals with clinical recommendations, you know, how you communicate that um, when you're working with people. Yeah, I think shared decision making is such an important topic. And it, it's also something that's relatively new ish to medicine, right? If you look kind of back traditionally, people used to go to the doctor and just be told this is what you're going to do. And it was okay, you doctor, you know it all and I will follow your direction. Um, and I don't know if it's been the more the advent of the internet or people just empowering themselves. But it looks very different now for, for most people. You know, some people still hold on to that traditional doctor-patient relationship and it scares them to be involved in the decision-making. They just want to be told what to do. So um, I certainly do meet people like that sometimes, um, but most of the people that are coming to our organization for informational assistance really want to know everything they can in order to be empowered to make decisions with their team. And there's a lot to learn. So there's essentially a whole new language of cancer to learn. If you look, try to look at a pathology report, it's like reading Chinese probably for someone who speaks English. It's, it can be nearly impossible. 
And like you both said before, you don't know what you don't know. And what you don't know, you can't therefore ask about. So that's kind of where I come in and uh, my, my colleague as well, who have enough of that background to look at someone's diagnosis. We can have them share their pathology report with us to understand their diagnosis and teach them about their diagnosis. Um, and then help them formulate those questions that they can then take back to their doctor to understand their choices better. Or they might come to us with, you know, they've been given some options, especially in breast cancer. They might be choosing between having a mastectomy versus a lumpectomy or doing chemotherapy versus not. And I can really act as a sounding board to talk them through those decisions. And again, like I mentioned in the introduction, it's not cookie cutter. I'm not going to say the same thing to Janet as I am to somebody else. I want to know Janet and what her values are, what's important to her, um, and then help people make those decisions accordingly. So, you know, you can take someone making the same decision, for instance, um, someone who's trying to decide whether or not they want to proceed with chemotherapy treatment. Um, and for you might offer them the same statistic even. Like for instance, this may improve your chances by 5%. And for someone, they hear that 5%, they may be young and have small children and they think, yeah, I will do anything and everything for that 5% possible advantage. I don't care if it ends up that I can't feel my hands and feet. I don't mind if it impairs my cognitive function a little bit. I just wanna be here for a long time for my kids. And then you might have someone who's you know, in their 70s and they feel like they've had a good life and it's more important for them to spend the last years of their life just with the highest quality of life. Maybe they like to play the piano or garden or do art. And the thought of not having their feeling in their hands might really frighten them. Um, or maybe they're a caregiver giver for an elderly parent. There are just so many things that can come into play such that that 5% for someone else might be, mm, no, I don't think that's worth it for me. Um, so that's kind of my approach to really get to know the person and their values and then make sure that they do um, accurately understand information. Because I think in oncology especially, and probably across medicine in general, um, and I have a PhD, not an MD, so I might be a little biased here, but you can make things sound uh, you can almost market a treatment to people to make it sound better. So there are some drugs that I could say, oh, if you do that, that will decrease your risk of recurrence by 50%. But that's a relative risk of recurrence, right? That it's reducing. So you could state that same information a different way and say, well, your, we estimate that your risk of recurrence is 10%. So if you took this drug, Yes, it will reduce it by 50%, but the absolute benefit for you is 5%. So that sounds way different to me. In one case, you're telling me a 50% benefit, but it's actually a 5% benefit. So I like to make sure people understand exactly what they're getting into um, so that they can make an informed decision that aligns with their values. So yeah, long story short, I like to think of myself as kind of like an informed sounding board. I don't provide any medical advice to people, but I feel like I have enough background to really help them through the process and talk things through and um, maybe clear up some misconceptions that they have about certain treatments. And then, you know, the, the ultimate goal is that they can go back in their next meeting with their doctor as a more informed patient, ask better questions, and make that uh, informed decision for themselves. 
Love that. You, you're you in some ways a translator. <laughs> we were talking about the, you know, learning Chinese. If you're, you speak English, like it's the same type of thing. It's, it's how do I, <laughs> how do I even process this to make a decision? So I think that's so wonderful. Um, a translator and a guide. <laughs> <laughs> Very, very cool. Well, thank you both so much for chatting with me about this today. I'm so grateful, Janet, for you, for sharing your story and sending you all the love and, and healthy vibes through the, through the virtual, <laughs> the virtual screen here, but um, wishing you all the best. And Erica, thank you so much for all the work you do and for helping so many people in the cancer community. We're really grateful to partner with BACC and we will have a link to your website um, on this podcast club and on our website so that uh, people can find you. So with that, I will say have a wonderful day and thanks for being part of our podcast club. Thank you. Thank you so much, Molly. Awesome guys. Thank you. So This podcast, show notes, and newsletter is for general informational purposes only and does not constitute the practice of medicine, nursing, or other professional health care services, including the giving of medical advice, and no doctor-patient relationship is formed. The use of information on this podcast or any materials linked from this blog is at the user's own risk. The content here is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Users should not disregard or delay in obtaining medical advice for any medical condition they may have and should seek the assistance of their healthcare professionals for any such conditions.